Good evening or good day uh, to everyone who is joining us. Before we begin, as a reflection of University of Sydney's recognition of the deep history and culture of the land on which it was built, I would first like to acknowledge the tradition of custodianship and law on the country on which the University of Sydney campuses stand. They stand on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. And I extend this acknowledgement to any other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here with us today. I further acknowledge the traditional owners of the country on which you are on and pay respects to their elders, past, present, and future. My name is Goran Agergic, and I am a lecturer at the Department of Government and International Relations, as well as the US Studies Center. Uh, and for a good chunk of this year, I've had the privilege to be affiliated with the NATO Defense College. And uh, somehow in, in the middle of this fellowship, this uh, sort of uh, other role presented itself where I've become a moderator in a great series of events uh, that the US Studies Center is conducting with the NATO Public Diplomacy Division. So this event is just the latest in a series of talks with US Study Center and NATO next experts in which we explore the challenges ahead of NATO and Australia and where we try to propose some areas where furthering and deepening cooperation can offer solutions. Today on the agenda are the arms control efforts on part of the Alliance, something that has been said to be in the very DNA of the Alliance, but that hasn't been addressed nearly enough. So just a few housekeeping notes before we get underway. Your microphone, camera, chat function, and raise hand function have all been disabled because we are in a webinar mode, but rest assured that we do want you to participate and to ask questions, and this can be done at any time by typing them into the Q&A box you'll see on the bottom of your screens. You can ask and vote for questions, and the selection will definitely be answered during the Q&A session towards the end of our conversation. Apart from being streamed live on YouTube and Facebook, this discussion is being recorded for later access on the US Study Center's media channels. Now back to the topic. Students of NATO know the Alliance has long been preoccupied and engaged with the issues of arms control, disarmament, and proliferation. Since uh, at least the late 60s, the Alliance's security policies have moved along two fundamental and complementary tracks nuclear deterrence and arms control. And most recently at the 2021 NATO summit in Brussels, the allies have once again referred to the arms control as an essential contribution to alliances security and strategic stability. On the other hand, rising tensions between major powers, all engaged in some form of new weapons or nuclear modernization programs and continued proliferation from smaller nuclear armed states make the prospects of resuscitating and establishing a more robust global arms control regime very bleak. So to discuss the role NATO can play in overcoming this impasse and where Australia stands, I am really happy to introduce an interlocutor who is responsible for overseeing NATO's efforts on arms control, disarmament, and, and non-proliferation. Ms. Irini lemos Maniati has recently been appointed as the acting director for NATO's arms control, disarmament, and WMD non-proliferation center, or ACDC in NATO parlance, which makes her a leader of a rock star center within NATO. And since 2018, she was holding the post of the deputy director in the center, advancing NATO's policy on all aspects of arms control, disarmament, and non-proliferation. Prior to this post, she was appointed as NATO Secretary General's representative for the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe following a Warsaw Summit decision to enhance relations with the OSCE. And between 2010 and 2015, she was the first NATO senior civilian liaison officer to United Nations, a post that was established by NATO HQ following the signing of the UN-NATO Joint Declaration in 2008. 
So um, we de decided that we would give uh, Ms. Lemos Maniati a couple of minutes first to offer some introductory remarks. And following on from that, we will get straight into conversation about the most pressing issues on the arms control agenda. Uh, and as I said, we do really welcome uh, you sending through your questions uh, via the Q&A box, and we will uh, respond to those as we go further in uh, this webinar. Thank you again. And Ms. Lemos Maniati, the floor is all yours. Good afternoon, Gorana. Um, and uh, thank you for all who tuned in from Australia. Fantastic start uh, for my start of the day. And uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to have a conversation on arms control. Uh, as you rightly said, my office is the Arms Control, Disarmament and Weapons of Mass Destruction Non-Proliferation Center in the NATO parlance, as you rightly pointed, ACDC. And we are responsible for uh, supporting the Allied uh, efforts in developing, improving, strengthening uh, arms control, disarmament, non-proliferation policies and agreement. So it is my great pleasure to have this morning with you, with the NATO uh, US Study Center, and take part in these expert talks to share our perspective on the importance of arms control and NATO's role in this regard. So I will use the next uh, 10 minutes, if it's OK, to lay a little bit out what is arms control, disarmament, non-proliferation, and why it matters. Um, how NATO views this agenda, what is our role, and, you know, throw a little bit of some lines on uh, our priorities and the way ahead. So let me start by the beginning, you know, the arms control disarmament and uh, what, you know, the weapons of mass destruction non proliferation or ADN. It's another, you know, at NATO, we're very good at uh, acronyms. So uh, the famous ADN agenda. And I do that because it's very important to understand the tenets of this agenda and why it matters for security and stability. Um, as we all know, you know, our, our ADN is a body of agreements, norms and treaties between states that they can do certain things. They can limit the numbers and types of weapons that states are permitted to develop, build and deploy with their militaries. It restricts the ways that states may use these weapons and it controls the proliferation of such agreements. ADN is especially concerned with preventing the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear weapons. And for the nuclear weapons, it also creates the conditions for a world without nuclear weapons. ADN is not just about the weapons of mass destruction, nuclear arms control. It also includes a series of important conventional arms control agreements in Europe, the Open Skies Treaty, the Vienna Documents, the uh, Convention of Forces in Europe, that encourage states to be transparent with each other about how they use their, and you know, defines how they use the military forces. The purpose of the conventional arms control is not to disarm states, is not to restrain states, it's but to reduce the risks that states can misinterpret each other's action in ways that can lead to a conflict. So how does NATO view arms control? So obviously many students may ask, you know, NATO is a military alliance. Why are you concerned about arms control? Aren't you in the business of defense, not in disarmament? As clearly stated, and I think you've had previous sessions on the NATO communique and you've discussed the NATO summit, we remain fully committed to upholding and strengthening the arms control disarm and non-proliferation agenda because we view this agenda as an important security policy tool will help, which helps make the world a more stable and more predictable. We see it very much, and I think Goranam, you mentioned it, as a complement to our more traditional military tools, deterrence and defense. And as you know, we call that the dual track approach, deterrence, and arms control at NATO work in parallel. And therefore, we are very much committed to preserving effective and verifiable, verifiable arms control agreement to enhance our security. But let me make one point that arms control is not a panacea. 
they would not work when there is no shared interest to avoid unintentional conflict or arms races. It really requires a political will and a commitment to comply with your obligation as a state, and it cannot prevent an, an intentional armed conflict or wars. No arms control agreement, for instance, prevented Russia from annexing Crimea. Arms control, in other words, brings predictability, security, and stability, but when it is respected and when the parties comply. Now, what is NATO's role in all that? As you know, we're an alliance of 30 democracies. We are not a party to any of these treaties. We don't sign agreements. But what we do, we serve as a forum for allied consultations on all security and defense related issues, including obviously on arms control. As you rightly pointed out, since our establishment, NATO has been a, a very important platform for allies to discuss and coordinate their arms control, disarmament and non-proliferation policies and priorities to build consensus, develop common positions for the use of uh, in other international fora where these issues are debated. New York, Geneva, Vienna, The Hague. So we do have a long track record in doing our part in supporting these agreements. We have contributed to the Helsinki Final Act. At, I wouldn't say this headquarters, the old headquarters, we debated articles of the NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, the Vienna document, the Convention of Forces Agreements in Europe, the Open Skies Treaty. We have supported the negotiations on the uh, INF Treaty, New START and other agreements. NATO policies is based on strong consultations and developed by consensus like anything else at NATO headquarters. So while we do a lot, we consult, we do not have the authority to sign or implement treaties or agreements. So we also support allies in coordinating and implementing their own individual obligations under arms control and what we call the confidence and security building measures. We have helped disarmament efforts, including in the area of small arms and light weapons. We have destroyed over 600 tons, thousand tons of weapons more than 160 million rounds of ammunition and many other aspects in the area of small arms light weapons. We have provided training and we continue to provide training and education in the implementation of those treaties, the Vienna document, the conventional forces in Europe, the Open Skies Treaty. On the CBRN environment, we seek to build capacities and help allies and partners be able to mitigate um, uh, consequences but also defend themselves against uh, weapons of mass destruction um, and support each other in the event of an incident or attack. We conduct exercises, training, share of best practices, but also try to understand the civil military cooperation in the event of a CBRN uh, incident, knowing that, of course, always the first responders will be the civilians. But also what we do, we work very closely with our partners including Australia and other countries and international organizations, um, non-governmental organizations, academia, to share our perspectives, to share our understanding and the evolving environment in terms of arms control, disarmament, non-proliferation. Arms control, which is the core element of what we call the international rules-based order, is not a NATO issue only. We can't, we don't own that issue. Therefore, strengthening and adjusting these rules to meet the current and evolving security challenges is a matter of con concern, not just for NATO, but obviously of the broader international security and community. So we need to work closely with our partners to ensure that the international norm and the agreements that have served us so well for so many years and kept us safe are strengthened and adapted. We, and therefore we maintain an open dialogue. For instance, over the past 17 years, we've been holding an annual event, the annual Weapons of Mass Destruction Conference, which we address the whole range of arms control issues, uh, from the missile proliferation to the recent challenges with the chemical weapons, how to strengthen the NPT. And there, what is very important, we have countries from all over the world participating. 
we have India, we have Pakistan, we have had China participating. And it's important to maintain this dialogue with everybody on these important issues. As you may know, NATO summit in June outlined an ambitious NATO 2030 agenda. Um, the leaders, they agreed to enhance NATO as uh, the transatlantic forum for coordination and consultations, including on, on arms control. They also agreed to enhance NATO's ability to preserve and shape the rules-based international order in which, as I mentioned, arms control play, play a crucial role and a major role in that. So the, the leaders, they invited the Secretary General to lead the process to develop the NATO, the next strategic concept, which will also reflect the Alliance level of ambition in the area of arms control. All of these taskings will drive NATO's internal thinking on how to strengthen arms control as a security policy tool. What further contributions can we and NATO can bring in this regard? And this is particularly important when we're considering the current security environment with increasing challenges to global arms control regimes, challenges to our security, blatant violations of taboos and regimes that we've had for years, um, complete disregard of our obligations. And allow me to elaborate a few of those. Russia's continued violation of its arms control obligations and commitments, including the INF, which unfortunately led to the US decision to withdraw and to the ultimate termination of the treaty, for which Russia bears the sole responsibility. This treaty was profoundly important for allied security and its demise leaves a gap in the international architecture that has to be filled. The erosion of the norms against the use of chemical weapons, as shown by the recent use in Syria, Iraq, Malaysia, Russia, but also in the United Kingdom for the first time in an allied territory. The increasing and continued proliferation challenges from DPRK and Iran, India, Pakistan, the recent entry into force also of the prohibition of the nuclear weapons, the ban treaty, which seems appealing for many, but it in reality would do nothing to reduce the nuclear weapons in the world, has no nuclear weapon states on board, and it risks undermining the best tool we have actually in doing so, the non-proliferation treaty of nuclear weapons. But another big challenge are the emerging disruptive technologies. These technologies have the potential to append many of the foundational assumptions behind international arms control. These agreements, you know, the arms control agreements were mostly forged during the Cold War with the Cold War era weaponry in mind, a very different technological context. Um, these technologies are very much enablers rather than new weapon systems. So categorizing them as, you know, in the good old days, our arms control agreements is challenging to say the least. You know, getting parties to agree to accept accepted levels or, of deployed nuclear weapons is hard enough. But how could we ever identify what's an appropriate quantity for AI or quantum computing for a military to deploy? Another challenge is China's rapid modernization of its military weapons, its nuclear ar arsenal, applying enormous resources to military innovation, while at the same time, it is not part of our arms control agreements. But I don't wanna just paint a, you know, a bleak picture, a grim picture. There is a glimpse of hope. The extension of the New START Treaty between United States and Russia, um, as well the renewal of the US-Russia strategic stability dialogue which seeks to establish a, a foundation for a new arms control framework um, where they want to seek to address all Russian nuclear weapons and explore options for additional confidence building and risk reduction is very important. This dialogue sends a clear and a positive signal for the future, notably as we approach the review conference of the non-proliferation treaty. But there are also other initiatives, initiatives about the outer space, about the responsible use, initiatives about embracing the concept of principles of responsible use when it comes to new technologies, which depend less on restrictions on specific military systems and more upon national commitments to using technology in ways that don't risk unintended escalation. So 
quite a big challenging environment. So what is NATO's role? Um, so we are pursuing efforts to, first of all, support the global arms control with a particular focus on the nuclear non-proliferation treaty. We want to uphold and modernize the conventional arms control and confidence and security building measures, the Open Skies Treaty, the Vienna Document, the Convention of Forces in Europe. We want to address the Russian missile challenge that developed in violation, uh, the missiles that they were developed in violation of the INF Treaty. We want to support the development of use of emerging and disruptive technologies or arms control efforts where applicable. And of course, we must maintain also, we want to maintain a dialogue with China on arms control. So our way ahead is we should not compromise on rules-based international or order. It served us and kept us safe for many years. And this is a message that was underscored at the NATO 2030 agenda. We must uphold and reinforce existing agreements. We must close loopholes, address non-compliance, and raise the political costs of those who do not comply. We must contribute to a successful outcome of the NPT Review Conference, which is coming up in uh, a few months in January. Um, there are important initiatives that have been initiated that create the environment for nuclear disarmament. This is an initiative some of the many countries of the NPT have initiated. Initiatives around nuclear uh, disarmament verification, very important aspect of arms control. Um, on the NATO side, on nuclear arms control, we support and want to facilitate the negotiations of new agreements that would include more weapon systems, but also more countries like China. And we want to reinforce the allied unity on these issues and coordination and cooperation with our partners, including Australia. We have seen in the past that arms control works. Arms control came up in the peak of worst period of relations. So it is in our collective responsibility and, and uh, it's in our interest to ensure that these agreements will work also in the future. So with that, I'm ready to have uh, to close my initial remarks, giving you a little bit of an overview of nature's thinking, the importance we attribute on arms control, and I'm happy to um, dive into the conversation with you, Gorana. Over to you. That's excellent. And thank you so much for this very broad uh, uh, picture and very comprehensive picture of where we've been, uh, what's going on, and where we might be heading. And as you say, uh, even though the outlook uh, looks uh, pretty bleak, there are some pockets of hope. Uh, at least uh, that, that's what I got from your initial remarks. Um, I'm going to put a very kind of academic head on and um, I'll let you know how I uh, thought about dividing our conversation into basically kind of three major themes. One uh, which deals with just the organizational politics within NATO and where ACDC stands and then to look maybe a bit more into the internal dynamics in terms terms of NATO member states and then get to uh, some of what you have already hinted at some of these external considerations, obviously, knowing that it always takes two to tango or in some of these cases a lot more uh, to actually strike some of these uh, agreements to actually get to the point where you sign and ratify treaties. So I want to go back to this first issue and that is in terms of the organizational stance. We know that deterrence and defense have been enshrined, obviously, in the in the DNA uh, of the alliance with the Washington Treaty, and that certainly, as time moved on, but potentially uh, uh, the kind of critical juncture being the 67 ML uh, report uh, is the kind of point where uh, deterrence and defense are to be accompanied with dialogue, right? This sort of idea that defense and detente would go together. But it seems to a lot of um, those who are keen observers of NATO um, that security inevitably trumps dialogue that more often than not, we see that considerations that have to do with defense and deterrence tend to 
to, to sort of push aside efforts around arms control. And here's just one of the recent sort of points that uh, uh, some of those who are very much in the know of, of arms control uh, and, and disarmament uh, uh, policies um, say that in 2019, the military strategy uh, that was developed by NATO military authorities which is a classified document, uh, didn't actually in the kind of public statements even mention arms control once. Now you can <laughs> maybe uh, shed some, some light in terms of you know, where ACDC stands uh, within NATO. How much does your voice get heard? How many uh, of, of you are there compared to say other uh, divisions that have to do with defense and deterrence? Thank you, Gorana. Um, um, it's an interesting uh, debate all the time, you know, the deterrence and defense and arms control. Is it either or? Um, you said that, you know, a deterrence and defense is part of NATO's uh, DNA. But as I said, and I think our Secretary General clearly has mentioned several times, actually arms control is part of NATO's DNA. And if you look, you made a reference to Harmel. Um, dialogue, which is, you know, the manifestation in a way of the arms control, is part of our discussions, uh, is part of NATO's um, uh, thinking in terms of security and stability. Um, I think what has happened over the years is that there was, after the 80s, there was this, you know, a number of, um, after the, the fall of the Soviet Union, there were a number of agreements that fell into place. And there was a sense of positive cooperation. Um, and these agreements provided the, the um, if you want, the context for uh, dialogue. And you thought you had the feeling that arms control fell back. But actually, arms control has been at the forefront of our efforts at NATO um, when it comes to uh, our, for instance, we're looking at the uh, missile challenges, the Russian missile challenges. This is not only from a deterrence and defense point of view, the answers. We're looking at arms control answers also to this challenge, because for us, arms control is a core element of our, of our um, uh, security. So how does ACDC, I think we work very closely with our colleagues in other divisions uh, to make sure that both arms control and the deterrence and defense agenda go hand in hand. Uh, these are not either or, these are not perceived as either or agendas at NATO. On the contrary, they're, um, uh, I think they're gaining more and more attention, particularly now that the security environment becomes much more, um, there's much more uh, competition. Uh, arms control agreements have been uh, eroded, they have been um, uh, some of them do not exist anymore. And therefore, you hear that agenda more and more, I would say, uh, in the global environment, in uh, the uh, the NATO uh, statements, uh, the NATO summit, I think it's an indication of how the importance that NATO gives to that agenda. Uh, and for us, uh, I think the, the both sides goes uh, together. So ACDC stands, you know, in the political, we are the political, if I may say, uh, the the manifestation of the arms control agenda. We support actually the allied discussions and we support it also in, in uh, this. Another important aspect of this is we support it in our dialogue also with our partners. Uh, this is an increasingly important agenda with our partners. So um, deterrence and defense for us and arms control, if I may say, go back to the original is one you know the other side of the of the coin um so uh we don't see it as either or we don't see it as less important on the contrary uh, when these agreements were stable when these agreements were there you may have heard it less now that these agreements are falling uh, some of them are violated some of them are don't exist anymore this agenda gains momentum to ensure that our deterrence and defense adaptation goes hand in hand with all these agreements um that can provide predictability and stability. Great. Um, and then from the organizational kind of and bureaucratic dynamics to, to maybe step up a bit and, and think about 
uh, just the, the politics that goes on, obviously, in a 30 member uh, alliance where we know that power asymmetries and preferences are very obvious. Um, as you said, NATO obviously is not in the business of signing treaties and agreements. These are prerogatives of governments, of nation states that uh, do that according to their own national interests. So from your experience, um, consensus building, how hard or easy has it been? We know that there have been some famous episodes, uh, most notably, I think a lot of historians like to refer to the, the dynamics of the late uh, 1970s, early 80s, where uh, the, the kind of political uh, tensions uh, were, were so high that, uh, you know, there were serious questions uh, around the, the kind of longevity and durability of the alliance. But obviously, we know, you know, United States, we, we study U.S. Uh, politics and foreign policy uh, here at, at the center, we know that by far it, it brings the most of any ally in terms of its nuclear and conventional forces and in terms of uh, arms control certainly it would have a much stronger voice than, than other 29, not that they uh, don't have a voice. Uh, again, the, the, the name of the game is consensus building. But we know also there have been traditionally these rifts between, say, on the one hand, those that traditionally argue for a greater role for dialogue and arms control, um, say Germany or the Netherlands, uh, some of the Nordic states, Canada, France hasn't been too happy with references to arms control in NATO business um, and the admission of uh, some of the newer member states from Central and Eastern Europe, uh, for instance, has tipped the balance more towards uh, the skepticism uh, over the value of dialogue and arms control. Um, so with, with that, um, and, and I'm naming names <laughs> so that you don't have to necessarily, but uh, how hard is it really, you know, now uh, to kind of wrestle with, with these asymmetries and the different, different uh, preferences uh, where we know that, you know, um, again, uh, national governments uh, do ultimately respond to their constituents and that national interests are the, the coin of the realm. Excellent question, Gorana. Um, you know, the alliance is a, is a, a body of 30 democracies, right? Uh, building consensus is never easy. Uh, it's never easy, not just on arms control, it's never easy for any topic. Uh, 30 democracies means 30 points of views that they will have to come through intensive consultations to a common position. Um, this is the same for arms control. Uh, it is true that sometimes, you know, you may have different perspectives as you come to discuss specific agreements or spe specific issues. But at the end of the day, consensus is built through dialogue. And that is why over the years and now at the summit, the importance of the enhanced consultations in order to strengthen the rules-based international order has been highlighted at the highest possible level and you saw the summit playing an important an important role to that um, we cannot shy away from our differences we do have different perspectives we come from different um, um, approaches in terms of the importance of uh, deterrence and defense and arms control but what matters is that at the end of long discussions indeed long discussions some of them a common consensus a common position a common understanding has prevailed the inf treaty with the russian violations it was difficult consultations um, we had but through those consultations through the information we have seen and we have uh, 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 provided, we, the allies, and here you have 30 different allies, agreed that Russia is violating the treaty and they were supporting the US decision to withdraw from the treaty. It Was it easy? No, it was not easy. It's never easy. But it is through these constant consultations that we will be able to strengthen, adapt, and enhance our arms control uh, architecture which is a core element of the rules-based international uh, order. 
um, so, and as you said, you know, this is, um, they're national governments, they have their own constituencies, but at the end of the day, they come here for the aspects of security and defense, and they, all the allies understand the core value of arms control as an important tool that complements our security, uh, deterrence and defense, and our security. So yes, like in any other NATO topic, I won't hide that there are differences. I won't hide that there are consultations. Um, but it is these endless consultations and discussions that can take time, can take months, but at the end of the day, I think the message that comes out of the summit, right, a very strong commitment on arms control, rest assured that every word has been weighted against 30 nations. Um, and the message, I would say, one of the strongest messages that has come out of this summit on the arms control agenda is very positive. Because at the time when we're strengthening our deterrence and defense, given the competitive, competitive and challenging security environment, the allies, all the allies, uh, all the member states of the alliance following in intensive consultations have agreed to a very strong commitment to arms control, to nuclear disarmament for um, uh, as part of the uh, NATO 2030 agenda and as part of the NATO summit. So yes, it has been, it is difficult. Consultations and consensus, it is difficult, but it's not impossible and we have managed it at many difficult points of NATO's history, and I'm confident we'll manage it in the future. Now, you mentioned United States has the lead, of course, you know, in, in uh, the New START Treaty, following, you know, the now the strategic stability talks. But that doesn't mean that the alliance stays idle and just sits there. Like in the previous agreements I mentioned, the alliance plays a role. We use our consultative forum here to debate these agreements to understand these agreements. These agreements will have a, in, are important for the whole Euro-Atlantic security. Um, so uh, it's, it's important to understand that these discussions are important for all 30 allies, that the consultations are important for all 30 allies. And therefore, um, um, uh, the Alliance brings this unique platform, unique platform not only because of the 30 nations, but unique platform of the expertise that exists here, right? We are an organization with the military and civilians sit together and analyze and discuss these aspects from an arms control perspective and from a deterrence and defense perspective. So um, yes, uh, these discussions can be difficult, have been difficult, will be difficult, I'm convinced, but we have an important role to play and I'm I'm very sure, like in any other topic, issue of the alliance, that consensus uh, building will remain, you know, is our core element and we'll be able to uh, overcome the different opinions of 30 democratic states that um, uh, have, you know, come with their own perspective. Great. Over to you. So taking an extra step up then and getting to those external consideration being considerations and being mindful that we have about uh, 15 or so uh, minutes remaining uh, for, for our conversation today. Uh, you mentioned Russia a couple of times and obviously uh, this goes back to the very history uh, and, and the kind of raison d'etre of, of NATO even though it has changed uh, over, over time. But Certainly, it seems that, um, as, as uh, you said, there are uh, a lot of issues there on the table where we have seen repeated breaches and, and just uh, the unwill unwillingness to, to cooperate on matters on, of arms control. And um, there certainly also are some encouraging signs uh, coming off uh, of that meeting between President Biden and President Putin, uh, which obviously uh, resulted in the agreement on the five-year extension of New Start and the, the kickoff of the strategic stability dialogue. Now, it seems that American and Russian interests towards strategic weapons are increasingly asymmetric. Um, U.S. is primarily concerned with Russia's nuclear weapons, including some of these new and very exotic uh, nuclear weapons and non-strategic nuclear weapons. And on Russia's side, 
Um, there are primarily concerns over US non-nuclear weapons, including ballistic missile defenses, high precision uh, conventional weapons, for instance. So uh, given that there is this asymmetry, that there is also in terms of political will, you know, less of it than there certainly was some uh, decade ago when presidents Medvedev and Obama uh, were signing the, the New START treaty. Where do you see is the most plausible uh, um, sort of area or platform to uh, start managing uh, some of these issues? Thank you, Gorana. Uh... Indeed, uh, first of all, the um, as you rightly pointed out, Russia has, um, you know, has continued to diversify and has continued to uh, its arsenals over the years. Um, it deploys, you know, a number of uh, missile systems um, uh, around NATO. Um, it has modernized 80% of its strategic nuclear forces. It expands its nuclear capabilities. Um, and it also, this is combined with a very responsible and aggressive rhetoric. Um, so what is important in this context is that um, the dialogue is very difficult, but the US-Russia dialogue has brought, as I mentioned in my intervention, a glimpse of hope. Um, a glimpse of hope for uh, addressing all, all nuclear weapons uh, at the moment uh, when it comes to um, uh, the Russian arsenal uh, and the increasing Russian arsenal, they are, um, we, you know, there, there are discussions, there are ongoing discussions um, that it are very important to understand, to reduce risks and to be able to identify a pathway to uh, provide some predictability and give um, a way ahead, if you want, for future arms control uh, negotiations. Um, they may have different interests, there may be different aspects, but I think my understanding is that all these aspects are in the context of the discussions of the US and Russia dialogue. And I think what matters is that this dialogue continues, uh, it won't be Obviously, it will not be an easy dialogue. Never did any bilateral agreement come overnight. Uh, these took years and negotiations, um, and they hopefully will establish the foundation for discussions for the new arms control agreements, um, as I said, that seeks to address all uh, Russian nuclear weapons, um, identify risks to escalation in order to inform uh, additional confidence and security security uh, building measures for risk reductions. So, you know, it's, 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 it's the beginning of the dialogue. We have uh, uh, the team, the US team are engaging in this dialogue and we look forward to really seeing the, uh, the beginning of a foundation for the future arms control negotiations that will address uh, all uh, challenges related to um, uh, nuclear weapons. Thank you. And this brings me to, to the next question, again, one that you preempted in your introductory remarks. Um, and that's obviously the question of 21st century great power relations, obviously, uh, management of relations with China, whether it's in the context of US foreign policy or for that matter, the alliance policy, given that for the first time, um, at just this past uh, NATO summit, the Allies have also pinpointed that China's assertive behavior and rapidly expanding nuclear arsenal, I'm quoting here, um, are a threat to the international order and potentially to the alliance's interests. Um, but despite the pointing to the increasing threats posed by China's military modernization and political rapprochement with China, the Allies in Brussels have also left the door open for, and I quote, meaningful arms control dialogue, reciprocal, uh, reciprocal transparency, and confidence building measures that would benefit both NATO and China. We know that obviously under the Trump administration, there was a push to get to a new start deal, which would be essentially a kind of a trilateral uh, rather than a bilateral uh, deal. Um, what are the necessary next steps? Um, 
from NATO perspective, uh, especially some of these uh, uh, issues that surround confidence building um, and opening that space for dialogue with a country where, which obviously doesn't neatly fall obviously in the, in the focus, uh, geographical focus, so to speak, um, of the Alliance traditionally. Thank you, Gorana. Indeed, uh, China is one of the uh, um, challenges, as I mentioned, in the context of the environment we're meeting in, in uh, when, when we're looking at arms control. And, and as you pointed out, you know, China is expanding its nuclear arsenal, uh, more warheads, large number of sophisticated delivery systems. Um, uh, and, and the most troubling part is that there is this is happening without any limitation or constraint. Um, the Russia-China cooperation is also a concern, uh, more military exercises. Um, so in, in this context, obviously what matters is transparency and confidence and security building measures. And one aspect that we are saying is that China is, a, you know, as a P5 country, as a responsible uh, an, an increasingly global player has also responsibilities to take as uh, a nuclear power country. So we do hope to see China more talking about its doctrine, uh, risk reduction measures, confidence and security building measures in the context of P5, but also in the context of uh, in its eventual dialogue with the United States. Um, we are firmly committed to upholding the arms control agenda and they have to uh, we we have urged and i think the summit became very obvious the, china to engage in a meaningful dialogue as you rightly pointed uh, uh, out uh, one first step is transparency you know uh, transparency has served as well it serves dissipate uh, concerns by other countries uh, and enhance international security um, transparency is not, you know, made to uh, to weaken defenses or restrain any other country. It's a mechanism very much to reduce risk. So China's engagement in arms control discussions, China engagement in transparency and talks about its its uh, doctrine, uh, its um, uh, activities will be very important. Um, we have uh, encouraged a dialogue with uh, China. We do have actually a dialogue with China on arms control. We want to enhance that dialogue with arms control or on arms control with China because there could be opportunities together to address uh, challenges uh, in, in the arms control uh, area. And particularly when it comes to preserving what has served as well the international rules-based or order. I think strengthening the international rules-based order is in the interest of China as well. A stable and secure international environment is in the interest of China. So for us, it's very important to maintain a dialogue. At the same time, it's also important that China takes part in a number of other activities. Verification, you know, nuclear verification. China used to be part of um, the uh, International Partnership for Nuclear Verification. They can be part. They just need to, China has to come forward and cooperate on a number of issues uh, to build trust and ensure through transparency become you know the global player with a global responsibility that it uh, it uh, corresponds to its uh, presence in the international sphere as a p5 also responsible uh, player so um, we really encourage and have encouraged china and the secretary general you have heard him several times in his speeches addressing china because China has an important role to play uh, in the international environment. Um, so for us, it's clear that we need to move, uh, we need to continue the dialogue and we hope that that dialogue will also be continued with, uh, um, in, in, uh, from China and uh, continue the dialogue with us on these important aspects of security, which is the arms control. Thank you, Goran, over to you. Great, uh, and, and thank you for that. And I've just noticed that our, our Q&A box is uh, filling up with questions and some of them speak to uh, the sort of last question that I wanted to ask you more broadly about um, modernization 
of weaponry and, and uh, the role of technology. And there are several actually aspects to this question. Um, so whether it's, you know, uh, how do you manage technologies cooperatively, cooperatively through arms control uh, in terms of the nuclear forces, because we know that at the same time, uh, these, these new developments could make them more survivable, but at the same time, uh, we, we need to find a way how to mitigate the, the risks uh, where actually there is a, an escalating threat. But um, that's just one aspect where uh, modernization and, and technology plays a role. Uh, some of our uh, webinar participants have pointed out to uh, the issues that are emerging, for instance, from the supply chain issues and uh, production of weapons where uh, controlling key building blocks from proliferating is one of the vital parts uh, of, of the whole issue of arms control. And then also another question that came about, and I'm trying to pack them all together to just maximize uh, uh, our time and then give you a bit of a, a break to, to also uh, 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 sketch out some, some, some of your final thoughts on that. Um, the question of cyber uh, um, attacks, cyber warfare, um, where does arms control stand in all of that? Uh, so those are three questions that I've sort of distilled from uh, a number of uh, those that have been coming up uh, on the Q&A box and, and in pre-submission. So thank you, uh, all of you who have uh, engaged with us, and, and I hope that we can offer some uh, uh, final thoughts uh, on that before we start wrapping up with the webinar. Thank you, Gorana. Um, uh, where to start? I think, you know, the big unknown is these emerging disruptive technologies. It is something that we all grapple. Um, uh, it's an area with huge opportunities, uh, but also huge challenges. And when it comes to the combination of emerging disruptive technologies and arms control, um, there are, there are frameworks and agreement that can help regulate but there are many that they are not and the challenges are that we are not at at the moment we're not i think in the area of of legally binding i think the path where we're looking at these aspects is we can't at the moment be in a legally binding path it's much more about regulating the responsible use of those uh, emerging disruptive technologies. And I think this is where the direction it goes. And that's because, you know, in the good old days, uh, the defense used to be very much also state owned. Uh, now we have private sector owning this, uh, uh, enabling, if I may call them, uh, uh, technologies, which they may not be a new, as you rightly point out, weapon system, but enables, it changes the nature, the quality of, of uh, these, of the weapon systems. So I think um, for where it applies, some may apply in terms of existing arms control, but I think what where, where we are is mainly about ensuring the responsible use of those technologies as we develop. Uh, and, and you know, there are, it, not everything starts at NATO, you know, there are big initiatives and particularly when it comes to the emerging disruptive technologies space, there are important initiatives that are already in the way the um, CCW in, in, uh, in Vienna, in Geneva, they're looking at, you know, the main principles of responsible use of those uh, emerging disruptive technologies, they're talking about the application of humanitarian law, they're talking about, you know, the the accountability, the human accountability vis-a-vis -vis the decision making. Uh, these are aspects that we we are looking at them and that they're very important as we look at this, as we you know try to understand these technologies. We don't have the answers, but I think the best way again to ensure that as we move into this domain of new emerging disruptive technologies, we build the the, the bridges to for trust between the state and, and, and private sector between states as they develop. We establish transparency uh, efforts that can help understand um, the, uh, the approaches um, and, and abide by responsible behavior that is much broader than a legally binding, you know, the traditional arms control agreements which were created during the Cold War 
quantifying specific aspects, which, uh, you know, with, uh, I can't even understand how, you know, uh, quantum computing can be quantified or AI can be quantified. Um, so uh, that's in terms of uh, emerging disruptive technologies. Uh, so I mentioned the CCW, but there are also an, uh, other uh, initiatives and I want to, uh, for instance, make reference to the UK. Um, uh, there's a big initiative going in New York now on the um, uh, space and uh, responsible behavior in space. And I think, you know, we can go and discuss about legally binding agreements. There's more, you know, outer space becomes critical for our everyday uh, operations, communications. Um, instead of trying to coming up with legally binding agreements that at the moment are not possible, there are uh, uh, there are frameworks that we can develop to ensure responsible behavior, to ensure responsible use, uh, so that we reduce risks of escalation, we reduce risks of any um, any. Uh, um, unintended consequence, if I may say. And the same applies to cyber, right? It's, it's equally another domain, which is a very difficult domain about uh, arms control and cyber. There are a number of initiatives, again, uh, taking place, trying to regulate, trying to make sure uh, there are at the UN in, uh, important initiatives that had taken place uh, with the group of governmental experts. I think what matters is that uh, we maintain consultations, we maintain dialogue, we try to allow the opportunities that these uh, technologies provide us with, but also we try to make sure that we regulate them in the way so um, we can all benefit of those technologies, but also ensure predictability and stability. So these technologies are not used to increase arms race, reduce predictability and reduce international stability. So you will see uh, a lot of discussions on, the, on these topics from a NATO perspective. You will see uh, um, the importance that these topics, particularly in emerging disruptive technology, will play in as we are looking at the future arms control agreements. Uh, and uh, for us, that will be um, a matter of discussion from now, uh, as I mentioned, particularly when we look at where do we go with arms control agreements? What are the next steps? Amazing. And I think that we have done the full circle now coming back to what you're, you've said and opened up with that uh, it's always better to go Jojo rather than war war to borrow from uh, Churchill and I will thank you again. Uh, it's been a great pleasure talking to you Miss Lemos uh, Maniati and I wish you a good day in Brussels uh, and thank you all for joining us at this third webinar in the series of NATO USSC talks. Um, I would also like to invite you to register if you already haven't for our next talk uh, by the US Studies Center uh, expert and senior fellow uh, Bruce Wolfe, who will be hosting uh, Dr. Sarah Binder and Thomas Mann uh, in a discussion on the future of US politics. Certainly something that's uh, very germane to what we talked about, given that all of the three that we've discussed need to actually pass the Senate with two thirds majority. So domestic politics matter. Uh, that's our time for today. Thank you again for being with us and uh, stay tuned, stay safe uh, for all of you in Australia and in lockdowns. And I look forward to talking more in one of these occasions on uh, all matters that have to do with transatlantic relations and beyond. Thank you again. Thank you, Gorana.